Hello, this is Dr. Nina Kim from the University of Washington. Today, I will be discussing hepatitis B reactivation. In this mini lecture, I will review why this clinical event is important to know and avoid, and touch on HBV virology and pathogenesis in understanding this. We'll talk about what happens as HPV reactivation unfolds. We'll discuss who's at risk and what factors in the host, as well as in the clinical scenario, contribute to risk. And I will talk briefly on antiviral prophylaxis. And finally, we will tie these concepts together in a case example. At the heart of this matter is the persistent nature of hepatitis B infection. In this depiction of the viral life cycle, you can see that the virus, upon entering the liver cell and eventually the nucleus, integrates itself into the host genome. And in doing so, the virus establishes itself through covalently closed circular DNA as a template for viral expression. In other words, an individual who has been exposed to the virus remains at risk, even after resolution of acute infection, of having recurrent expression of the virus with the loss of immune control. And why HPV reactivation remains even more relevant today is because of the growing array of biologic agents, specifically monoclonal antibodies targeting various aspects of our immune system, some of which have been shown to increase the risk of HPV reactivation. So what happens in HPV reactivation? For this portion of the talk, I will be referring to hepatitis B serologic markers. To familiarize yourself with these, please review the mini lecture on this topic on our HEPI online site or our YouTube channel. HPV reactivation occurs primarily in two main groups of individuals, those with chronic hepatitis B infection who are surface antigen as well as core antibody positive. In these individuals, a two log or a hundred fold rise in HPV viral level above baseline or a viral level that rises 1,000 IU per mil or greater from previously undetectable level, or an HPV viral level of 10,000 IU per mil in someone without prior testing counts as HPV reactivation. The second group are those who have previously been infected and recovered. They are generally surface antigen negative, but core antibody positive. In these individuals, any detectable HPV DNA or the reappearance of surface antigen is enough to count as HPV reactivation. These viral changes are generally accompanied by hepatitis flare, which is defined as a serum alanine aminotransferase, or ALT level, increase of threefold or more greater from baseline, or greater than 100. The first event in HPV reactivation is the rise of the viral level, shown here in green, followed by evidence of liver inflammation or a rise in serum ALT in magenta. You can see that the rise in liver enzymes can be brisk and severe with ALT that can exceed 5,000 IU per liter. These changes can progress to jaundice and acute liver injury and further into liver failure. And that is why it is important for everyone to recognize HPV reactivation, because at its worst, it can cause significant morbidity when it progresses to acute liver failure, and it can be fatal if not recognized promptly. So who is at risk for HPV reactivation? So there are a variety of clinical scenarios where hepatitis B reactivation can occur. The first three settings involve immunosuppression of some kind, and these are the more common scenarios that I will be addressing today. The last three are special circumstances where HPV can reactivate that I will not be addressing in my talk, but these are worth noting. Assessing an individual's risk of HPV reactivation involves two components evaluating their HPV status, but also their intended immunosuppressive therapy. And when we consider these scenarios, we can group them as low, moderate, and high risk for HPV reactivation with probabilities as shown here. So let's first look at those who have chronic hepatitis B. Therapies with the highest risk for HPV reactivation include B-cell depleting monoclonal antibodies that target CD20 receptor of the B lymphocyte, used for treatment of lymphoma or autoimmune conditions such as multiple sclerosis, anthracycline derivatives, a class of chemotherapy that includes doxorubicin or epirubicin, and chronic moderate to high dose steroids, typically those that are comparable to 10 milligrams of prednisone or more daily for four weeks or more, and then TNF-alpha inhibitors such as infliximab and adalidumab. Of these, 
Rituximab, or anti-CD20 therapies, deserve special mention. This and similar B-cell depleting agents carry a particularly high risk of HBV reactivation in both patients who have chronic infection as well as those who have resolved infection. It was through increasing reports of HPV reactivation with these agents that we learned the key role B cells have in control of hepatitis B infection. The risk of HPV reactivation is serious enough to warrant a black box warning for this complication, and anyone who uses these medications needs to be aware of this risk. Additional therapies that confer high risk of HPV reactivation in those with chronic infection include these various agents some of which are associated with lower certainty of evidence. Therapies with moderate risk for HPV reactivation include anti-T cell therapy, specifically abatacept, which is used to treat rheumatoid arthritis, and longer-term steroids that meet the four-week duration threshold but are not quite 10 mg daily dosage of prednisone or its equivalent. This list are the agents that are associated with low risk of hepatitis B reactivation, and they include short-term corticosteroid therapy of a week or less, as well as intraarticular steroid therapy. Let's look now at risk stratification for those with resolved hepatitis B who are core antibody positive. Therapies with the highest risk for hepatitis B reactivation in those with resolved infection include B-cell depleting monoclonal antibodies that were discussed previously. This is the main class of medications to be aware of in this category. Many of the other therapies previously discussed are considered moderate risk in patients with resolved hepatitis B. Low-risk medications include immune checkpoint inhibitors, TNF-alpha inhibitors, and steroids that are four weeks or more, but low dose, or less than a week duration. Intraarticular steroid therapy is also low risk for those with resolved infection. So once you have assessed the risk of hepatitis B reactivation in your patient, how do we decide who should receive antiviral prophylaxis. The latest American Gastroenterology Association guidelines have simplified the recommendations to favor treatment in those in the high or moderate risk categories, with a stronger recommendation for those in the higher risk category based on the quality of evidence. Low risk individuals can undergo monitoring alone. There may be patients who place a higher value on avoiding long-term use of antiviral therapy and its associated costs, and place a lower value on avoiding the small risk of hepatitis B reactivation. These individuals may reasonably select active monitoring over antiviral prophylaxis, but clinicians should carefully consider the feasibility and likelihood of adherence to long-term monitoring. Monitoring should include the assessment of ALT and hepatitis B viral level at an interval of one to three months. What we use for prophylactic antiviral therapy is the same as what we use for oral treatment of hepatitis B, and that is tenofovir as either formulation or entecovir. Lamivudine is not recommended for much of the same reason it's not recommended for treatment, since the threshold for viral resistance and breakthrough is low. And duration is generally for the time that the patient is undergoing the immunosuppressive therapy out to at least six months after the therapy has ended extended out to at least 12 months, I generally err on 18 months after B-cell depleting therapy. So let's run through a case. This is a 50-year-old woman with a long-standing history of multiple sclerosis with gait instability, who has a recent diagnosis of optic neuritis. Her neurologist is considering ocrelizumab. She has hypertension, type 2 diabetes, and no obvious HPV risk factors. So which of the following would you do next? Start ocrelizumab with quarterly hepatic function panel testing. Send hepatitis B surface antigen. Send hepatitis B core antibody or assess HPV status with triple test panel. The answer is D, that you would send the triple test panel that includes the surface antigen, core antibody, and surface antibody. You need all three results to fully characterize a patient's HPV status. So her hepatitis B panel shows a positive core antibody and a negative surface antigen and surface antibody. So which of the following would you do next? A, start ocrelizumab with quarterly monitoring. B, start entecovir 0.5 mg once daily for HPV prophylaxis. Or C, start ocrelizumab and monitor for clinical symptoms. Or D, send hepatitis B E antigen and E antibody. The answer is B, to treat 
And the reason we treat is because ocrelizumab is a B-cell depleting monoclonal antibody with high risk of HPV reactivation. So that regardless of whether you are a chronic carrier or someone with core antibody, but negative surface antigen, the recommendation is to treat. For a deeper dive into hepatitis B reactivation, please check out our lesson on the hepatitis B website, which reviews in greater detail the clinical decision-making and guidelines. The production of this Hepatitis B online mini-lecture was supported by funding from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention.